If you were to preach a sermon at your church on housing, what passages would you choose? What passages? The Mighty Prophets, absolutely, talks a lot about housing in there. Any other passages you might look at? Oh yeah, I like that one. Thank you. Settling down. And, that, and they had to settle in a place they didn't want to be. They were in Babylon, the last place they ever dreamed they would be. So um, land in the Bible is amazing. I'm going to just take you through a quick span in five minutes or less, maybe more. Land, you can't separate land from housing, right? It's all connected. So the first sins resulted in what? A marred land. It affected the land. The very first argument between Lot and Abraham, what was it about? It's about land, right? Because they didn't have enough land for their, their agricultural, their, their um, sheep and their... And then the very first five books of the Old Testament, they're all about preparing people to go into a promised land. So when, in all of my doctoral training, all of my education, we didn't talk about land. But it's everywhere in the Bible, everywhere. And so here the first five books are talking about going into the promised land. The book of Joshua, the whole theme is about dividing the land among the 12 tribes. And then you get to Leviticus and it's detailed laws. So people say, oh, we have too many laws. You know, we have to get rid of all this regulation. Well, some of that regulation is important and the Bible certainly has a lot of regulations. And so in Leviticus, there's one chapter that's called land use, in Leviticus 25. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Actually, I'm going to tell you a little now. So in the land use is, talks about what's called Sabbath, where everything in Israel is organized around the Sabbath. All creation, in a sense, is organized around the Sabbath. And so the idea is that every seven days we're to rest, time for worship, that's good for our bodies to give ourselves a break. And then every seven years, the land is to rest. You ask any farmer and they'll tell you how important that is to have good production. And then every seven times seven years, well, it's somewhere in there also you forgive, you, you know, you let slaves go free. <laughs> and then every seven times seven years is the Jubilee. And that's where land goes back to the original owner. It's a very dramatic real estate practice, very different than how we do things um, in, in our country. So the idea is like this. Let's say you're a real wheeler and dealer and you're good at acquiring a lot of land, but you knew that the end of those 50 years that you would have to give some of that up. Land goes back to zero. So you buy land at year 45 before the Jubilee, it'll be more expensive because you get to land, have it and use it for 45 years. If you buy land at five years before the Jubilee, it'll be less expensive because you only have it for five years. So it's just the opposite of how we do land where everything just keeps increasing in value. This is a way to stop and break those cycles. But God has a way in society, about every 50 years, we have a big bubble and a burst. So God typically kind of makes this happen, whether we like it or not. He, but there's many countries that have actually used this, this work, this kind of land redistribution, and it's built this, the strength of the economies. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. But these laws were intended to be applied. And God laid out these laws so that people like Naomi and Ruth would have access to land. So Naomi and Ruth, um, they were landless. They came into an area. She was a foreigner. Um, she was loyal to her mother-in-law. There was other laws that helped alleviate poverty. She could marry the closest of kin, the kinsman redeemer, and she could glean on the fields. So all these laws were both about trying to bring end poverty. Um, and then you've got the prophets. So here we've got the kings. God never wanted Israel to have a king, but he allowed them, they kept begging, he allowed them to have a king. But in the same time that he gave kings, he gave prophets knowing that kings tend to do the wrong thing and they need accountability, right? So all these prophets were screaming down from heaven and saying, 
you better care for the poor and needy, for the or orphan and the widow. That's the central focus of every single prophet, is caring for the poor and challenging those, those kings to do that. So did they obey? In some ways, yes. But they kept messing up. And so what was the promise if they didn't obey these laws? That they would lose their land. Again, a big theme of land. And you've got the whole book of Lamentations. Lamentations, the, what's the main theme of Lamentations? It's grieving. Grieving over the loss of Israel's land. They lost their land. Then you come into the New Testament and you think, gosh, is there anything about land in the New Testament? Actually, it's really prominent. And so you've got Jesus who opens the Bible. He opens the scroll in the, in the synagogue. The first words he opens and reads from Isaiah. He says, I came to bring good news to the poor. What's that good news? Well, sight to the blind. So we're all blind. We all need to see. This morning, um, we, we heard the beautiful prayer about light and how we need light to see. We don't even see the homeless. Today when I read the newspaper about someone who died in her car in, in, uh, in, at Disneyland, um, who was homeless for years, you know, we, who, people didn't see they were blind to her need. She, she couldn't talk about her need. She was so ashamed of that. And so we need eyes to see. We need eyes to give us light. And then sight to the blind, release the oppressed from the oppressors. You know, what is that? That's radical stuff. And then the way that gets done is to by proclaiming the favorable year of the Lord. That's Jubilee. All scholars agree that that's Jubilee. And Jubilee is basically land redistribution. How many sermons have you heard where Jesus talks about land redistribution? I haven't heard any. There was a pastor in Pasadena. He did a fabulous job with a, this whole passage. I walked up to him afterwards and I said, you know, I love the way you preach this message on this passage, but you left something out. He says, yeah, I know. <laughs> and I said, how come you didn't talk about the Jubilee and land redistribution? He says, I want to keep my job. So, land redistribution, the early church got it. They lived it out. They figured out what that meant. They sold homes. They had all things in common. And you know what the result was? Right there in Acts chapter 4, it says there was no poor among them. They perfectly lived out what the Jubilee was about. So, that was the purpose of the Jubilee, um, to alleviate poverty. I've kind of sped things up so that allows me to kind of um, uh, skip over a few slides. Um, but I want to make sure we read this powerful passage. Um, it says, the Old Testament was concerned with place. Walter Brueggemann, he's one of my favorite authors, uh, he has a book called The Land, a whole theological study on land in the Bible. The Old Testament was concerned with place, specific real estate that was invested with powerful promises. Israel's fortunes between landlessness, which is the wilderness, the exile, and landedness, when they became a nation, and the latter either as possession of the land or an anticipation of the land or the grief over the loss of land. So there's many lenses by which we can see scripture. We could look at scripture in terms of relationships. We could look at it in terms of, of um, many different theologies. But I've chosen to look at it from the perspective of land. So this is the, this is the very first quote in the Bible that talks about land and its use. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and govern it. So how are we doing on these? How are we doing on the first part of that? Multiply. I think, we, I think we, got, we got that one down, right? We got that one down. Now, what about governing it? There's been a misread of this, and many people think it means to subdue, take control, as if you have absolute dominion, you can do whatever you want on that land because you own it. Whereas a, a more biblical idea is to steward it and use it according to God's rules and God's laws. So, um, so how are we doing on that one? 
on. The Catholic priest and writer, Wendell Berry, is a, a wonderful quote here. Says that um, if the earth does grow inhospitable toward human presence, it is primarily because we have lost our sense of courtesy toward the earth and its inhabitants. But one thing that's good news about affordable housing is that they're on the forefront of stewardship. So affordable housing has been, since the 80s, 82, has been built with tax credits. That's the main funding source. And so you cannot get tax credits. They're highly, highly um, competitive. And unless you get score really high, there's about 400 points you have to score on. And if you get a near perfect score, you'll probably have a good chance of getting those tax credits. Well, a large chunk of those 400 points have to do with green initiatives in the development. So you've got, in Hawaii, it's the first net zero housing, all completely affordable, pretty much off the grid. It's, it's an amazing. So what that means, net zero, the building itself uses as much energy as it, as it uh, creates. There's a similar building called um, Colorado Court in Santa Monica, and it was the first 100% energy neutral affordable housing. So it's very similar to net zero, but it provides opportunities like what I do in my home with my husband. We pay a little extra for green energy. So we are, what, what we get in our home is all green energy. So um, one of the things that also make uh, affordable housing, many, the whole tiny home movement, is uh, catching on in places around the country. And we have an opportunity through what's called ADUs, accessory dwelling units, in our backyards to create more housing that's smaller in scale. Uh, typically is very, very green. The last Christian Community Development uh, Conference that was in um, Detroit, um, I made a little extra tour there for we could go to see the CAST community, tiny home community in Detroit, where they're actually allowing having homeless buy their tiny homes. So they're earning equity and, and really breaking that cycle of poverty. That's what they did for low-income families in New York through home purchasing. And the two, fam two family homes were brilliant because that enabled you to rent out part of your home and that have offset your mortgage enabled you then to uh, afford your home. So the tiny home movement um, typically is, is actually less than half, sometimes a third of the amount of energy because of the, the size of the home. So what we've done in Pasadena, in my home, we built a little back house and we have a friend that we've known for a long time who was homeless for years and he stays there. And it's been a beautiful arrangement having him live with us. We're really good at breaking things a lot of times. <laughs> he's really good at fixing them. <laughs> so he's an excellent construction worker. And so it's become a very symbiotic, wonderful relationship for us. Um, we've been able to do some pretty creative things um, by taking out our grass. Grass absorbs, it's kind of like a sponge. Um, about 70% of your water use goes into grass. If you have a permeable surface, it allows the water to sink, sink down in uh, to the water table. So we took out our grass and put uh, decomposed granite. And then we got a, a vault, a used vault, which was cheap. And we got solar panels. Wouldn't believe it. First uh, time that we got our bill, it was $1.52 for all of our electricity, all our electricity use for two months, including our car and our house and air conditioning. We could not believe it. Then we took all of the water from our house and we pipe it out to all our fruit trees. So we've cut our water use by half by getting rid of our grass and also gray water systems. We have about three different gray water systems. It's been a lot of fun figuring out how to do this. You can go to my husband's blog and it tells all about what it is. We've spent about 18,000 on all of this. Um, people say, like cities right now planning their green initiatives for the city, they, they say, well, let's try to have half the amount that we're using now by 2035. And I'm going, hmm, we did all this in three years with $18,000. So I think we need to push our cities to move a little quicker in uh, becoming green. So the Royal Command is so important. It's the most important command in the entire Bible. It's repeated many times.
to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And if we really love God, and we really love our neighbor as ourself, I think of it as like a triangle. You can't separate loving God from loving neighbor. You can't separate loving neighbor from loving yourself. You can't separate loving self from loving God. It all connects. You can't lop off any corner of that triangle. And so, if we really love God, and if we really love our neighbor, then we should want what we want for ourselves, for our neighbor. To have a home that we can afford. To have a home that is um, affordable because the utilities are low, as well as helping the environment. You can cause a lot of, of um, landfills to be filled up by tearing down homes. So what Church of the Savior Washington, D.C. did, they took whole apartment buildings and they purchased them and made them affordable. And um, this particular one called the Mozart had 900 code violations and they got to work. It was just five women. They didn't know what they were doing, but they knew they were following God. God, they had a small prayer group and God said, buy this building. They said, we, we're, are you sure, God? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so they ended up, one of them got their realty license, they talked to the man who was um, the owner, and he was willing to give them a good deal. Um, all the pieces came together, there was a wealthy philanthropist in their church that said, you guys can't do this, and, and I'm not going to support you in this, and, and when they saw how busy they were and how willing they were to do the hard work, he said, okay, I'm going to cover the cost. And so that was Jim Rouse, and he's the one that started the Enterprise Foundation based on what those five women and their belief was about. That's the largest technical support to help you build affordable housing that's all across our country that was birthed out of, of, uh, out of this church. Another model that helps good stewardship is adaptive reuse. And so you take an existing building that is an eyesore or is just unused and you change it to another use. And so there was a Presbyterian pastor, an Episcopal priest in Atlanta that saw this prison that was just sitting there since the 1850s and completely um, in shambles, but they couldn't tear it down. The walls had been built with steel reinforced concrete, which was the first, they were just testing that type of construction. It was, it was big, thick walls, it was way overbuilt. And uh, there was no way they could tear it down. They didn't know the tensile strength at the time of steel reinforced concrete. And so what they did was they collaborated with all the um, architects in town. So all these architects typically compete for, with each other. Well, they brought them all together. They found the blueprints from this thing. It was like the Dead Sea Scrolls. They got so excited. They cleared off the, the table and put the silver decan and, 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 and decanters and, and wine to dine these guys with linen tablecloth and said, okay, what can you do? And they crawled through the needles and they said, oh my gosh, we could do this, we could do this. And they looked at Bob and they said, so what's your budget? And he says, well, I, I think I've got about $4,000 in the bank. <laughs> and they laughed, just like you did. And they said, that's crazy. And he says, no. He says, it's not crazy. He says, if you all put your heads together and decide to work on this together, just even today, you would be raising over $100,000 just, just by deciding to collaborate and putting your, your pro bono time. And they, they, it was a seed of faith that was dropped into these men and two weeks later, they came together and they had a letterhead with all of their names and their contractors committing together to build this. They had a blast doing it. Um, this is the result. It's called Glen Castle. And it's for low-income families to be able to afford uh, at minimum wage jobs. The only government subsidy was tax abatement which is where they took it off. Can you imagine paying all the taxes clear back from 1850? <laughs> so so that, was, that was nice. Here's a church that was no longer in use. Um, this was similar to what happened in, Mon in uh, Sierra Madre, and they were able to build affordable housing there. Uh, another way is uh, what we mentioned earlier, some a type of, of um, manufacturing. This is called the Star Apartments. How many of you have seen these Star Apartments? downtown. It creates like a star. You can see the building. It creates it. So they took a basic 
uh, department store and they built on top of it and brought in all of these pieces and they house several hundred homeless families here. And then they have all kinds of sustainable things. They've got games, they've got uh, their own gardens that they, on different levels. So stewardship, distribution of land, distance, design, density, and sustainability. Those are a lot of really big words, but um, location is everything. You ask any realtor, location is everything. It's the same with affordable housing. We learned from some big mistakes. They had the great big um, housing, um, public housing that they would relegate to the edge of the city. It wasn't close to jobs, close to amenities. There were so many things about it that, that were not the, the best use, the best practices. So we've learned from our class mistakes. Um, you ask anybody in a conversation why they live where they do. Oftentimes people live in Pasadena. The teachers, 55% oh, of our teachers live between 45 minutes to an hour and a half away. Why? It's what they can afford. Um, so if you have enough housing that's affordable in a city, then you minimize traffic. Um, so city planning has everything to do with the importance of creating enough density to create affordable housing. Um, we have some core values that we believe deeply that everyone, what, what's your idea of what's the American dream, right? What is it? Owning your own home. And what's that home look like? A single family home, right? With a picket fence and a yard. That's the image we all have. We're going to have to give that to God. Nail that to the cross, okay? Because we will never sustain our planet with that model. It just doesn't work. We're going to have to shift how we think about housing. Um, property values. What do we worship? You know? Everything circles around, oh, that's going to be bad for my property values. And that's how you make a decision as a person of faith? I hope not. I hope that we will be the people that will challenge these core values and say, you know what? It's more important that I think about who my neighbor is than my property values. God will honor me and he'll take care of me if I honor God with what he says to do. You know, when we go to heaven, we can't take our land, our property values with it, but we'll take with us how we treated the least of these. The, the, the focus right there, um, who is our neighbor? That was a question that Jesus posed you know, at the Good Samaritan. And it was the person who was struggling, the person on the side of the road. So there's a quote here. It's interesting. I just read this this week in the LA Times. You might just want to start throwing tomatoes at me for <laughs> quoting the LA Times. But it says this, single family zoning is a worm in the LA's apple, uh, one of our original planning sins. Pretty radical, right? If we're going to address our housing crisis, we've gotta ha we have to start thinking about having those back houses, having higher density, having ways to, it's a sacred cow, and especially in a city like Monrovia, and I've got all these leaders right here. You know how much money they spend on preservation? Almost all their budget goes toward preserving those beautiful bungalows like what I live in. We want those beauty. I love all that. But we've got to, budgets or moral documents, and we have to think about where we're going to allocate the funding to preserve the beauty. Is there a way we can do both, make it beautiful, and create housing that's affordable? Yes, cuts been, we've had all kinds of cuts, but we are creative, and God can give us the ability to uh, figure out how to get the funding and the policy we need to get the housing.